So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Neve Denny, and I am the research coordinator here at the Reischauer Center for East Asian Studies. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce a person who needs little introduction in our circle and whom I have had the privilege to work with and learn from over the past four years, Dr. Kent Calder. Dr. Calder has been the director of the Reischauer Center and a professor at Johns Hopkins SICE for the past 18 years, after teaching at Princeton for 20 years and Harvard for four years. He served as Japan chair at CSIS for over four years and worked on Capitol Hill so he has a variety of experiences that have led to his research interests, which we'll discuss today. He also served as special advisor to the ambassador to Japan for over four years and has therefore seen DC also in an international context. His research combines his key interests of Japanese political economy, the transformation of Eurasia, and the role cities play in international affairs, as opposed to nations. In this series related to cities, he published Asia in Washington in 2014, which talks about how think tanks, research centers, the media, and lobbyists have shaped international affairs and foreign policy in Asia in Washington, DC. He also published Singapore, Smart City, Smart State in 2016, which looks on a state level at person-to-person -person networks that drive innovation in Singapore. Finally, his newest books on cities, which we'll discuss today, Global Political Cities, Actors and Arenas of Influence in International Affairs, is the product of research he has conducted for a good part of the last decade, which many of us here definitely know. Mm -hmm. Global Political Cities looks at how and why cities are reasserting their historic role at the forefront of international economic and political life. It also looks at why cities cope better than nations with global problems and how their strengths can transform both nations and the world in the future. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Kent Calder. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Neve. I uh, sincerely appreciate that, and I sincerely appreciate the involvement of everyone who is here. Uh, so many of the people here have worked with us over many years on this particular project, and uh, it's wonderful uh, to see them. And I really am thinking of all of the people uh, who contributed and all the work that they did as we. Uh, present this. Um, of course, we would all like to meet in person and I so that I could thank everyone uh, personally for everything that they've done. And we certainly do hope uh, in some capacity, not being totally redundant with what we have here, but in some capacity uh, to gather again uh, when this pandemic is over and so that I can uh, thank everyone. I would love uh, to do that. But I did want to give you and to give our broader audience, which I certainly also appreciate, a chance to uh, think about and reflect on some of the things that are uh, involved in this project, particularly because the role of cities as actors and especially as, um, as arenas for uh, policy uh, discussions for agenda setting that's of global significance is something that has so dramatically been presented here in Washington, D.C. over the past year. We can take ourselves back to uh, last May, last June, uh, to the national torment and the international to torment surrounding uh, the George Floyd's killing and the creation of Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington itself uh, as an example of the role of a global city as an arena for agenda setting. Or, uh, of course, this, this past January as well, January 6th, 
the insurrection at the on uh, our national capital and the debate uh, that has ensued since then uh, and continuing in some ways about the nature of democracy uh, itself. So um, cities, global cities as actors and as arenas for action is certainly a subject which is contemporary. Of course, when I started this book, um, the issues were, were different. Uh, but I've always, I should say just a word about what it is that uh, brought me to this book. I think, tend to think inductively at particular puzzles that I see in the world um, and that raise more conceptual uh, issues. And um, that has been uh, true, certainly, of my interest in Washington, that uh, ever since I came here to work on, on Capitol Hill as a Capitol Hill s staffer during the Vietnam War uh, as a, an undergraduate. And so it takes me back to quite a while and to tremendous transformations. But Washington as a socio-political community that lies at the heart of the most powerful nation in the world, but it's also a place where such dramatic events as we've seen in the last year uh, since Black Lives Matter uh, and the George Floyd issues became national and international are a good example. Um, so the dynamics of Washington itself, this is really a laboratory those of you who uh, remember a course that we did about Asia in Washington uh, for several years will remember uh, my saying that Washington really is a laboratory and Massachusetts Avenue on which we have been interacting for all this time is really a laboratory that uh, teaches us broader things about the nature of political interactions that have global significance. So that whole thing has interested me and that drew me to this topic. Also, um, puzzles about how the global political economy uh, function, the, the uh, dysfunctions, the incapacities of national governments, the innovative policies of cities. When I was um, my first major book was something called Crisis and Compensation and national government in Japan was often in gridlock, but the cities were innovating. They introduced a children's allowance, free medical care for the elderly, small business loans in, during political crises of the 1970s. Of course, more recently, some of the American cities. Um, New York City under Michael Bloomberg is one. Uh, bicycle paths, tree planting, uh, environmental policies that were so much more difficult, it seemed, for national governments uh, to introduce. So uh, those abilities of cities to do things that nations find it difficult to do that's another aspect that's always interested me. I do want you uh, to realize that this is an exploratory piece of research rather than confirmation. Um, uh, Aaron Lippart, the uh, political scientist, um, points out that to develop theoretical generalizations in an area where no theory yet exists is a serious enterprise, which really is what I have in mind here. We do introduce generalizations. We have hypotheses and test them. This is more, of course, a more general discussion, so I won't go into that. But I have been mindful of the question of how do you do serious research uh, that is academic as well as something that hopefully has a broader uh, public uh, implication and, and uh, is provocative uh, to everyone uh, who reads it. Um, this is about what I call global political cities, which are cities, global cities, that serve as no major nodes for governance, resource allocation, or a gender setting. Those are the major uh, functions of politics. And 
uh, what I'm going to deal with here is first of all, the issue of case selection. What cases? I'm dealing with 15 actually. This is quite a, a broad book that deals not only with Washington DC, although uh, Washington is where I started and it inspires a lot of uh, what is written here, but, but uh, cities throughout the world, including uh, many in Europe, many in East Asia uh, in particular, um, they're selected in terms of globally significant roles in filling these three political functions that I mentioned, uh, governance, resource allocation, and agenda setting. Um, what causes cities to be playing these new roles? As we'll see uh, as I, I present it, what I'm arguing is that since the mid 1970s, we've seen a sea change in technology, things like the coming of social media, uh, improvements in telecommunications and transportation that really have transformed the nature of uh, global interactions. And those are the driving force together with the emergence of financial markets that play on these new, uh, this new role of information and also the big geopolitical changes that have happened, particularly the emergence since the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the Soviet Union of one economy, global political economy, which is much more interactive, especially given the uh, emergence of the internet and so on than the world that was before. And so, cities are coming into a new world, which is rather different from what we've had uh, before. Now, uh, to look at these questions uh, briefly, I'd like to take you very uh, briefly through a PowerPoint uh, that I have. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, um, we have uh, 15 cases. I'd like you to just look at the cities in particular that I'm uh, looking at, um, but in particularly one, because the city of London is going to come back again and again. London, I think, tells us some things that are very important about global cities generally. As you can see, London has a very large- it needs, yes, ever more chips. It has a very large share of uh, its population is foreign born. It has uh, a very large number of think, uh, top think tanks, as you can see, next to Washington, D.C., uh, the most of any um, major nation in the world. Also, air, airline transportation, the connectivity of London is extraordinary. You can see Washington is also very high. I'll come back to this. But um, uh, the point of departure, again, is to take cities and compare them and to uh, find out how they relate. Now, um, Washington, just to situate where we are now, is a city with unusual global political influence. As you can see, obviously, Beijing lies in this ca the same category. In terms of international organizations, Washington has a similar character. Most of the other cities we're talking about are more economic uh, in their nature than uh, geopolitical. Um, now, um, also, Another characteristic of Washington is that transnational organizations, some of them lobbying related, some of them multinational firms, uh, some of them embassies of various countries, but Washington has a rather transnational character, I would argue, which is distinctive. For example, you'll see, I think there's a, some significant contrast to most of the key uh, nations of East Asia uh, in that regard. Not to say that East Asia is not moving in this direction. As we found, for example, in looking at Korea, I think Korea is, is definitely moving more and more in this direction. And for that matter, even Beijing with the World Bank, with international organizations, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no, with things like the national security law. Now, the uh, logic 
of the uh, uh, structure that we have. I wanted to show you the ICT revolution, the transformation of financial markets and geopolitical upheavals such as the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. Those have created since 1975 a very, very different world uh, than existed previously, which has led to a decline in nation state centrality and a rise of civil society with transnational dimensions that is creating new institutions in the cities which have particularly dynamic um, elements to them. And um, I can, I'll go into more detail about those. But first, uh, to take some of the forces, look at this rapid decline in transportation and communication costs. That's one thing. Um, also, volatility in international financial markets, particularly in the 1990s, 2008, of course, was a, uh, a tremendous watershed that has begun to change the global political economy and to influence the role of cities as well. And then finally, geopolitical change, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the changes that followed it. Um, now, what looking inside the global political city, um, there are four particular aspects that I look at uh, in, in this research. Um, and I look at them in some detail in the different uh, cities. Um, as to go back to uh, what uh, the definition of a global political city, I say that it's a global city that serves as a nature node of one of these three things. And let me explain or give you some examples. Resource allocation, that's budgets government budgets, for example, or in a city like New York City, the financial markets, of course, have this function. Governance, uh, legislation, the conventional um, aspects of governance. What is unusual and becoming more and more pronounced in the global political city is this, the things that we can see so dramatically um, over the last year. Over the last uh, year in um, in 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 Washington D.C. last summer, in um, in uh, Washington D.C. in January, in other cities as well. Uh, in uh, we've seen some of this, for example, in Hong Kong, in the last year. The role of grassroots groups or various other groups in uh, agenda, broader agenda setting that has broader uh, international uh, implications. So um, the global political city has uh, these different dimensions. Um, and I go into these in detail in the book. Um, also, the horizontal uh, linkages uh, across the globe between global cities. As you can see here, again, in the same time frame that I was talking about, the 1980s and the up to the present, there's been a very sharp increase in global city networks. Things like um, mayors, the Mayors for Peace in Hiroshima or CityNet or the C40, uh, which compare um, uh, policies across cities uh, that help cities to cooperate with one another. Many of them are engaged in, um, in, in uh, NGO related activities, but there's been a very sharp increase in global city networks, horizontal networks that also has been uh, helping to increase the role of cities from a global point of view. Now, let me begin to look just briefly in conclusion at the role of some of the major cities that we look at. And you will see, I think, the rather dramatic transformations that have begun to occur in cities. And this is some of the empirical work that we have done. Uh, of course, in the book, uh, you will see it in much more detail. Washington, D.C., I argue, is actually 
a global political city that has changed quite sharply uh, in the last uh, 30 years or so since sea change, uh, what I, the changes in information technology and finance began to transform the world, really since the 1980s. Um, the Dulles Corridor, for example, has emerged rather rapidly as one. The area out to Del Dulles International Airport. Also the uh, Baltimore-Washington Parkway up to the main campus of Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. That one also has uh, uh, evolved quite rapidly the, um, this, and around the uh, DC area as well. Uh, there have been some major changes. I, I can show you now um, some of the changes that have begun to occur. First of all, uh, take a look at Washington. This was, um, it's to actually categorize and, and uh, visualize these. Of course, uh, it's difficult to get data that shows it, but this, these are Washington DC think, think tanks that were founded before 1975. As you can see, they were quite heavily focused in Washington DC. And uh, as you'll, we're going to look at some other cities as well. And you'll see that Washington even then did have a relatively large number of think tanks, which is an in, uh, interesting indicator of what I call a penumbra of power, not in the government, but surrounding the government. Now look at Washington in uh, after, th th this is the year uh, 2019 as we were putting this book together. Once again, compare it. This is was before 1975, but this includes the ones that were founded recently. As you can see, outside the Beltway, out the Dulles Corridor, um, up toward the uh, Beltway, uh, it's more decentralized. And actually, as we'll see in looking at some other cities, one characteristic of Washington is that it's, um, you know, it's idea, industry, penumbra of power, um, the characteristics of Washington as a global political city are relatively decentralized, which I think is means access points. It means it's easier for um, outsiders to uh, interrelate with Washington. Now, Beijing. Uh, we've also looked at Beijing, and I will. I certainly do not claim to be a specialist. Um, in what on Beijing itself, but it is interesting to compare the transformation in the think tank structure of Beijing uh, in uh, 1975, of course, before the modernizations began, and then in 2019. So some you can see there's some increase. But if we were to go back to Washington and then look at the intensification, um, you can see that there is some, there's some difference in the evolution. Um, it, the, it's very difficult to, to get proper, appropriate data, I admit that. And th this is imperfect, but what I believe to be happening, and this is a exploratory hypothesis rather than a, you know, something definitive, is that one, one does have a phenomenon which is similar to what is happening in Washington, some proliferation of information institutions. Um, some, so there's some global uh, dimension to this, which is influencing major centers throughout the world. And of course, China, uh, Beijing is becoming a global center. And if one knows the downtown uh, a portion of, of Beijing around the uh, China World Trade Center and uh, so on, there certainly is a important complex or near the site of the uh, National Convention Center, places that evolved after the Olympics of 2008. Certainly there's been a some transformation in Beijing, which is a significant the emergence of information industry and so on, but it's not as rapid. And there are factors 
may be stronger than in the case of Washington, which have inhibited that development. What I really want to do is simply to open a discussion of the comparison of the evolution of the socio-political structures of major global cities, of which, of course, Washington and Beijing are two of the most important. It seems to me that this, together with obviously changes in national capabilities, but changes in institutional structure and information industries, is also an important uh, dimension of the evolution of national uh, of of, uh, of the world. Take a look at Brussels. Uh, Brussels, you see something similar. There's some, Brussels is more centralized. If you'll remember, Washington uh, is, uh, it, it's becoming quite spread out. The Beltway is becoming more important and beyond. In Brussels, it seems that around, for example, the headquarters of the uh, European Union in the center of Brussels, there's some proliferation of uh, think tanks uh, in that area. So, um, in some, these three uh, areas, I think, are, are progressing in somewhat parallel ways, but at different uh, speeds for reasons that uh, I think should be, could be very uh, interesting and important uh, subjects for uh, future analysis. Um, now, let me turn in conclusion to uh, a few of the points that I stress in the book. First of all, uh, cities have become, have been central actors in international affairs across history. From the days of the Greeks, of course, Aristotle uh, uh, stressed this in his writings. Um, the Westphalian era of nation state dominance since the middle of the 17th century has only been an interlude and I would argue that it is beginning to wane with the rise of cities uh, once again. Um, new city organizations are emerging and assuming more global functions. I mentioned several, uh, C40, uh, WeGo on sustainable cities, um, Resilient Cities Network uh, in, in New York City that Mayor Bloomberg has been involved with, CityNet based in, in Seoul in Korea. Uh, the number of these city organizations that are playing a more global role has tripled uh, since 1980. Um, so, I would argue cities are uh, rising, uh, continuing to rise in global importance despite COVID. I'm sure that this is an issue that people will raise. Let me just say two or three things about that. Um, I, I think the, the, the longer term reasons that global cities are rising are that they're uh, quick in responding to global change uh, in the internet era. Um, they have sophisticated idea industries. We can see this on Massachusetts Avenue. They have uh, natural arenas for grassroots, uh, uh, to reflect grassroots pressures. They can focus media pressure rather dramatically as we saw with those two huge events in Washington, Black Lives Matter and the insurrection at the Capitol in the last seven months or so. Um, the the most dynamic cities, I argue in this book, have uh, they share some special traits. Finance, and I haven't had enough time to get into this, but I do think that vibrant financial sectors play an important role. Diverse populations, high internet usage, populations that are connected and that travel a lot, a pluralistic political structure, relatively strong media, a uh, now the one big uh, conclusion is that I think the evolution of cities is not simply a function of the nation state. And the case of London itself is a particularly a striking one in that regard. London, and I found this again and again, London has played an important role on a whole series of issues, the anti-apartheid struggle, for example, 
the movement against uh, landmines um, on environmental issues, a range of uh, human rights questions, um, the uh, well, the evolution of the euro markets. It hasn't been uh, in lockstep with Washington D.C. Many of the things that have been stressed in Washington uh, cut in different ways than the uh, global geopolitical interests of the United States. Uh, and the British Empire has been declining. And yet the role of, Washington, of London and its ability to influence world affairs actually, I would argue, has, has risen. So London shows us that um, the rise of cities and the role of cities is something different from simply the rise of nation states. Um, so, uh, so that is something important. Now, you might say the two uh, issues that I'd like to take up in conclusion uh, cut against that, you might think. One of them, of course, uh, is Brexit. Isn't Brexit uh, going to cripple London or to greatly change its role? Of course, we don't have enough data on that point yet, but the logic of this exploratory argument is that a London, London's role should persist because of the nature of the sophisticated global institutions, uh, apart from the nation states, the insurance industry of London, the think tanks of London, which have the, the greatest global prominence except for Washington DC, uh, just to cite uh, two examples. Um, so, so London, I think, it, despite Brexit, should continue to and may even increase uh, its global uh, importance. The second question is, what about the pandemic? Uh, isn't it going to cripple uh, global political cities? First, I would look to the history, the uh, long uh, sweep of history. Of course, um, cities were important in the Middle Ages, as we know, and then the Black Death came along and the Black Death killed 60 million people and around half of the population of Europe. And yet the cities of Europe came back again after that. In uh, 1918, after World War I, of course, the pandemic killed 675,000 people in the United States. And yet um, the pandemic, uh, it was able to come back. Uh, the cities of, of the U.S. came back again in the 1920s and beyond. So um, cities were not crippled by those pandemics in the past. Um, but you might wonder about the present and the future. Why? What is it that is uh, enduring in global cities that will allow them to go uh, continue on beyond the pandemic? And uh, in short, and I'm sure this might be a point of discussion, one thing is their function in information exchange. Another is what they do in terms of network creation, just the human relations. And we can see these here at SICE and in Washington, D.C., the way that it, uh, it, you know, human networks are found or created and fostered in global uh, political cities. And then the validation uh, that comes about and again, I think the Black Lives Matter uh, and Black Lives Matter Plaza and the events of last summer in Washington, uh, I think to some degree can show this validation uh, function. So global cities uh, formulate policy ideas. They implement and articulate policy, and then they serve as forums that the world can see to uh, uh, support political uh, or global change. And so uh, those things are institutional, I would argue. And uh, so they should be uh, enduring uh, for the future. That is the gist of what I have to say. I wanted in conclusion to thank everyone here who has contributed uh, so much uh, to that.
but I do look forward also, uh, and we, I think we, we have some time for uh, a, a, a discussion. And um, uh, first, I guess, to turn this back, back to you, Neve. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Calder, and thank you for your presentation. As you mentioned, there are 55% of the world lives in cities, so I agree that this is a very important topic to discuss, to look at, and to do preliminary research, looking not only at the finance sector, population diversity, but also the strong media. But as you mentioned, um, the global cities have changed throughout history. We've had the Greeks, then Westphalia as an important period of time. But you mentioned Washington DC and many people say that the unipolar post-world, post-Cold World world, post world is drawing to a close and that American global dominance is declining. Do you think Washington can endure as a preeminent global political city if America's role changes? Uh, that's a very good uh, question, uh, Neve. Thank you. Um, I guess the short answer, as I see it, would be um, the, the London analogy, that insofar as a city's, um, is it has uh, sophisticated institutions for risk assessment, you know, and I, I wish I'd had more time. Maybe this is the moment to say a little bit about why I think that financial institutions actually play a major role in the emergence and the, and the development of a sophisticated global political city. Um, uh, because the, the world's financial institutions um, are, it's a, it's a market-driven phenomenon. Um, people, of course, can make careers out of, uh, out of finance and, uh, of course, it creates um, massive fortunes for, uh, for people. It, it creates inequality as well. There's no uh, question about that. And uh, that side of uh, global political cities is something that needs to be considered. But in terms of what drives them to play important information functions, and London, as I say, I think is a, is a very good uh, case in point, it's the um, development of sophisticated institutions for um, estimating risk. The uh, insurance industry, Lloyd's of London is a beautiful uh, case in point. Britain over the uh, years of empire developed very sophisticated uh, institutions uh, because it controlled the world shipping industry, I suppose is why this happened, that they're not just simply a piece of government, even though it's true that Lloyds of London did ensure uh, the British Navy uh, uh, ships, for example, and things like that in the days, um, in, you know, many years ago. Um, but estimating risk and calculating risk and helping to reduce uh, the risk that, um, that uh, bankers and other finance people incur in financing major capital investments. Um, those institutions that exist in London in insurance, I would say, are uh, are, are uh, sui generis. They, they're more sophisticated than anywhere else in the world. And their global political economic function is something that really needs to be looked at. That's one point. Another point is that the coming of um, uh, derivatives and the uh, changes in global financial markets that really began with the oil shocks of the 1970s. Uh, and continued, and they're continuing to this day, uh, for that matter, but um, to, uh, they're also parallel to the insurance industry, to reducing risk, uh, but also on the other side of the coin to enable speculation. Those uh, functions uh, that are so well developed in London, and they've become developed in New York, and 
Conversely, they are beginning, I would say, in some places. Uh, Shanghai, for example, has some of those characteristics that are beginning to develop, but they're much more uh, developed in uh, capital, capitalist economies. Um, down in Hong Kong has some of those, and certainly Singapore. I would say the most sophisticated in this regard is Singapore in Asia. But those, that complex of insurance companies, um, securities industry, uh, derivatives, um, requires very sophisticated information, which also has led to information industries and think tanks. These finance, the financial sector and bankers and lawyers and so on are by far the most important funders of the major think tanks of the world, including the Council on Foreign Relations, Chatham House, the IISS, International Institute for Strategic Studies, and so on. And this dynamic in some parallel ways is beginning to evolve in East Asia. Um, but except in uh, London, New York, and Washington generally, it's not driven by financial markets in the same way as it is in those three. And that is creates a very explosive and sophisticated function for uh, funding and, uh, but not just, it's not propaganda. It's not the kind of information flow that usually happens in a control oriented society because it's dri driven by finance, by the desire to make money. And it's, it, it creates inequality. I think certainly that's true. But it also creates, it, it, it creates a sophisticated information function, which draws not only capitalist societies, but also participants from soft authoritarian or authoritarian societies who need to and want um, candid information about how the world is operating. And so the synergy between finance and information, I would argue is explosive and rapidly developing and lies at the heart of the why it is that uh, New York, Washington and London, especially London, have evolved so explosively as major information centers. And as I say, they draw in China, they draw in Japan, Korea, and so on. For different reasons, in some places in Asia, parallel structures are going to, are beginning to evolve. And the comparative study of uh, risk assessment and uh, global uh, information industries across regions, I think is an extremely interesting one. But what that says uh, to conclude that point, and even in relation to your question of can Washington endure? Uh, um, well, I think if it allows these information functions to continue in a competitive way, I think uh, it will continue because it draws in everybody. People want, they don't want propaganda. They can't afford propaganda. It's not that they don't, maybe that people don't want propaganda. And I think the US government to some degree, just like all governments puts out propaganda. But the finance industry in particular can't afford, or the intelligence, for that matter, intelligence community can't afford uh, propaganda. And that may be the difference with an authoritarian uh, society. So I would say as long as Washington doesn't become too di diluted by propaganda and as long as it retains the ability to, to be um, uh, self-examining, Washington should continue to be able to provide this role. Now, some won't agree, and I, or some people may ask, what about the others? And, you know, is there some reason that John Stuart Mill lives only in London and Washington, D.C.? Now, I'm, I'm ready for that. But anyway, that's, that's my answer to that question. 
I'd like to remind everyone that if you have a question for Dr. Calder, please kindly raise your hand in the participants function. I, I have one more question for you, Dr. Calder, if you don't mind, and then I'd like to go to the audience. So please yeah. kindly raise your hands in the participant uh, box that you should be able to find at the bottom of your screen. And my, my second question is, if Washington really is this nexus of finance and information, do you think there will ever be another global political city like Washington anywhere in the world? And if there is, where would it be and, and why would it come about? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, that's a question where I really do look forward also to other people's ideas and and I think this is going to be it should be a, a, a major uh, question for debate in international uh, political economy at the micro level uh, going forward um, because <laughs> there there will be others who will have another paradigm I'm sure somebody's going to say well can't Beijing throw uh, money at it or can't Beijing, uh, can, I mean, if China is going to be so advanced in artificial intelligence or something like that, can't it um, d uh, develop a different kind of global political city that will equal or surpass what Washington uh, is? Um, well, I there are different kinds of political cities. I and I don't want to step on a discussion because I know that I, I think this is maybe one of the most interesting aspects of a discussion that we could have. But um, my short answer would be to say that if you know if this is just a matter of throwing money at it, that it's not going to produce. Uh, the sort of dynamic which has led Washington, more than Washington, as I say, I don't think this is a function of American geopolitical power so much. In fact, a lot of Washington's, uh, London's strength is, as we can see in the birth of the Euro markets, for example, was precisely because it was not Washington, because it was outside Washington, because it was the, the Soviet Union or China or North Korea or others were willing to trust or, or uh, to engage in London more than they were in Washington. They wanted didn't want to be, be under the thumb of the U U.S. government. So, um, so I I think probably the most dynamic environment for this kind of thing could be something like Washington uh, or a, um, a version of Washington. It might very well be someplace over in, the, um, in East Asia. Um, I will leave that to some of our specialists. What about um, Seoul, for example? What about Tokyo? What about Singapore? Or even what about Taipei? Could any of those be become, uh, or what about Hong Kong? You know, depending on your view of what it is that makes a global political city, uh, any of those uh, cities potentially uh, could fill this kind of a role. So that's just the start. Oh, Neve, I think you may be muted. I know we've done a lot of research on these cities and I certainly have more questions I would like to ask, but I think it's time that we turn over to the audience. Um, for our first question, I'd like to ask our, our researcher from last year, um, Evan Sankey, would you like to ask a question? <laughs> Hello. Hello, Evan. Good nice to see you, Dr. Here. Calder. Thanks. Thanks for the thanks for the presentation and thanks yeah, for the invitation. Congratulations on your new uh, position. Thank you. Well, congratulations on uh, on getting the book published. It's a it's a great accomplishment to finally be at the end of this. Um, my question is about um, about uh, an issue that I know you and I have talked about many times, which is uh, great power competition. Uh, how Neve touched on this a bit with the question about Washington DC. I'd like to ask it in a more direct way. Um, how is it that that the city that that the future is going to belong to cities if 
Um, if we enter an era of, you know, Cold War II or great power competition, uh, multipolarity, you know, we've seen, uh, we saw Brexit basically yank London away from continental Europe for essentially nationalist reasons. We saw, you know, we're continuing to see what China is doing in Hong Kong. Um, it seems unlikely to me that DC statehood will get very far because of national constitutional reasons. And I'm just wondering how you, how you think this will pan out. Will, for, for national security or just national patriotic reasons, will the state assert itself increasingly uh, to the detriment of cities? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Evan. Uh, that's, you know, of course, that is a, really a terribly important question. Um, I, to re respond, I would say, really the key consideration is the degree to which government um, in the two countries, inspired by the nature of their competition, um, suppresses the idea industries. Remember th that uh, we are in a global uh, market for information. And I think one of the conspicuous strengths of Washington, one of the reasons that Washington is well, is important as a global center, and I, I would I think the point is even more clearly put in the case of London. Why is London? important. It's because of the flow of information, the, the fact that you have so many um, different actors uh, acting in an in unconstrained sort of way and looking not for validation of their national objectives, but, uh, but maybe more importantly, just for information. At a certain stage in the Cold War, I, I think Sub Rosa Berlin had this character or you know, Istanbul during World War II, or um, well, London again because of because it was sort of an open field for competition and for espionage and for all of those things together, um, and so will and I think China arguably has begun with the national security law in Hong Kong is one aspect of that, but also uh, some of the uh, NGO legislation, uh, which has occurred uh, in China, has been um, cracking down, partly for reasons that are understandable in, in a national, uh, uh, quote, national security terms, namely that uh, it fears uh, others learning too much, or it fears espionage, or it fears NGO activity, or one thing or another. Um, but China has become quite restrictive on uh, information flows partly because of this great power competition. And in the United States, the, the issue I think is, is posed, will the US evolve in that direction? Or is the United States going to continue as a quite an open forum for information? Uh, my guess would be that great power competition is going to constrain the two great powers, which leaves the, uh, just as it did in the Cold War, which will uh, leave the room for the third parties, neutral centers, uh, Geneva or, well, in World War II, Geneva was, uh, Switzerland was a tremendous uh, area for espionage and information flow and so on as a global city precisely uh, because of uh, other countries were cutting off the flows. So um, yes, great power competition, I think potentially could uh, constrain uh, the role of America's major uh, political, uh, you know, global political cities, uh, particularly Washington. Although to its credit, I don't think we have seen yet uh, too much of that. Uh, it's a question of what happens from now on. How constraining in response to, say, the challenge of China is the United States going to be in terms of its own information industry? And there's where uh, I think it shows the, the value of the sort of things that John Stuart Mill uh, was uh, 
arguing in his, uh, his book on liberty. Thank you, Evan. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Olive. Dr. Olive, would you like to ask your question? Thank you very much. And Professor Calder, it's wonderful to see you for uh, another excellent new book, um, which is greatly welcome because I do think that the city has been somewhat invisible in international political economy and it has now come time to give it a closer look. I have also taken some recent uh, research in this field and I agree that um, cities that arise to the top do so for specific reasons. They don't always hold the pinnacle. You can think of Venice um, as the center of trade, uh, Florence, the birthplace of the en Enlightenment, or Lisbon, the centerpiece of international exploration as cities that have all faded into, well, let's say desirable uh, tourist uh, venues, but not still in international leadership. So there is a question of, what brings cities to the fore and how do they stay there? And you may be aware that there are numerous rankings of cities that have come out since Michael Porter came up with the idea of competitive nations. They've had this competitive mm -hmm. cities movement. Yep. Richard Florida put it uh, on talent. So now there's a global competitiveness index for cities that has come out in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And they follow various indicators. Um, many of them come down to two or three categories, um, the livability and the lovability. Do you, is it a livable and lovable city? And Washington tends to come way out on the top as it would, as it does in, in your metric as well. There's also the smart city rankings, which do include several Chinese cities. Um, this is again, a recent phenomenon. But what I would say is interesting about both of these rankings that you find from various sources, and there are numerous such rankings, is that liberal democracies tend to dominate the top rankings. Um, now you didn't rank order your cities, but if you did, would you find liberal democracies at the top? And secondly, how would you categorize the key element that could um, exclude certain cities like Moscow? Because if the issue is information uh, environment, I would not think Beijing would rank much higher than Moscow. Um, so that's, that's my main question is how would you exclude cities from your list? And would there tend to be a bias to liberal democracies given your interest in the information environment? Um, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, the first, those are very, very uh, good questions and several, it's kind of like a Merv missile. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, let multiple me warheads. <laughs> yeah, multiple warheads. <laughs> but uh, I, first of all, uh, I do think there are different types of um, of cities which uh, probably need different uh, ranking uh, 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 orders. This is a multivariate analysis problem. You know, and, and if, if we don't want to just get a fruit salad that's not meaningful, we really should segment the different categories and try to rank uh, or evaluate in terms of, of like, like quantities the, uh, rather than just uh, ge overgeneralizing. Um, you mentioned, for example, smart cities. You mentioned that China uh, ranks relatively high. Certainly, you know, I would argue Singapore ranks high, and I wouldn't dispute that in terms of the technical side and, uh, you know, the infrastructure that, you know, makes your heat and, uh, and lights operate well and uh, make sure that the trains run on time and all of that, that Singapore and the Chinese cities many of them will rank very high. In fact, they may be leading the world along those kinds of metrics. But that is a very different thing 
From Actually, they don't. They're more like in the, they're well below, well, Singapore's way high, but uh, the Chinese cities that have been included in these indices are not necessarily at the top. The liberal democracies mm -hmm. are. At, yeah, okay. You know, yeah. Well, it, it probably depends on where, I would guess. Certainly Singapore in Tianjin or Guangzhou or Chongqing. Right. There's been all of those joint projects, as you know, and yeah. Singapore has been um, sort of Show, giving its example or suggesting its example to the Chinese and they've been trying to emulate that. Anyway, yeah. I, I think that is sort of one, um, the sort of technocratic uh, version of this that, uh, you know, I mean, it's very consistent with a, an authoritarian model, but an efficient authoritarianism, if you want to put it that way. Um, but then if you're talking about a city that is capable of playing a informational role uh, in the world, then I think you've got to have, uh, uh, you know, competitive information flows and it, it coincides with the liberal democratic model. I think that is a different, it's a different uh, metric and a, at least two, I can see two. It, you talk about lovability, that's interesting too. You know, of course, uh, for certain aesthetics or uh, just the nature of the community, of course, many people love the city of Paris and uh, some of its characteristics, uh, you know, certainly, you know, like building uh, constraints, you can't build too high so you can see the sky and things like that. San Francisco does that kind of thing too. You know, that, that, you know that's another kind of character. That's not as political, but as far as what we're concerned with, I would say the two paradigms of the smart city and the kind of um, information city, mm -hmm. uh, uh, those two, you, there's maybe two or three paradigms that we ought to create. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. And uh, we can carry on this conversation separately, but thank you very much. I appreciate that. I agree. Thank with you. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting work. I'll be interested in seeing what you do with that, Marcia. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Amy Pike. Amy, if you could introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. Hi. Um, I. I'm a DIA student and I'm also an associate research fellow from Kaida. Uh, I hope we are included in this chart on table 1-1 one one as one of the three think tanks from Seoul <laughs> as top three tanks. Uh, Kaida is a uh, Korean Institute for Defense Analysis. We are mm -hmm. uh, think tank in Seoul. And um, I had one comment and it's actually related to the chart. Um, and I really like the chart, which compares all the cities with the indicators. And I know that uh, this book just came out and everything. But then since I totally support the argument how uh, Professor Calder looked at cities as an actor um, and how Professor Calder viewed the cities and how it cities compared to the nation state. Um, it is can... this, Amy, this is the one you're talking about, right? The, the chart that you viewed us with the PowerPoint. Yeah, I think yes. I, I, I don't know. My sh sh can people see it? Not yet. Oh, really? Uh oh, it's, it's the one with the New York, Washington city population, everything together. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I, my comment is just the general oh. one that um, how the, there was like a statement supporting is that how um, cities can cope better than nations with many problems. That is the reason why uh, professors study the cities carefully. And because of that, I thought perhaps if um, later some other factor can be added, perhaps um, how like each city has different like city council system. If that can be studied in the future, I thought that can be interesting subject to delve into in the future. That was something mm -hmm. I thought 
um, I oh, was I, I think in. it. I think it could. You know, there's many, many directions in which this kind of research can go. But you know, co comparatively looking at institutional structure cross nationally, if you can especially control for other important uh, variables, I think that's an extremely interesting, um, interesting area. Because the reason why I thought that was because. Um, I have been um, hearing how I was more touched with the chapter that uh, Professor Calder wrote about Seoul. And there were some um, Seoul mayors are very active in organizing international um, level conferences. And the way how it could go was organized faster was because it could go um, through faster with the city council compared to the, uh, the national level. So I was in, uh, more curious how it can be dealt in other cities compared to how it is. I know how it is dealt with Seoul, but I thought maybe with New York, maybe with London, how it is um, dealt differently. Maybe that can be another subject to study in the future. Oh, I think that's, that is very interesting. Um, you know, comparing institutional practices in one city that have worked cross-nationally and evaluating them, I think that's an area where we're going to see a lot of work. And um, I, I know Seoul has been quite interested in this, and there is, the, the, uh, particularly under, under Park Wonsoon, when, it, you know, before his, his death, of course, there was quite a bit of cross-national work and uh, Korea generally has been quite um, involved in the uh, comparative analysis of city practices, you know, best practices cross-nationally. Um, I might add just one thing about uh, Korea in comparative perspectives that's interesting that um, because the it, it is a relatively centralized nation state where uh, the city of Seoul, of course, is such a large percentage of the uh, national population, and the president has only is, is term limited just to a, a single term. Uh, it's quite common, as we saw in the case of Lee Myung Bak, uh, particularly, uh, but not the only. Um, that people who either uh, serve as mayor or uh, aspire to become mayors become presidential candidates and uh, also major national figures. So there's an interesting interaction between the city level and the national level. And of course, Ban Ki-moon was secretary general of the United Nations for much of the period I was looking at too. So among all of these different levels, of a governance, there is an unusually dynamic uh, pattern of interaction in the case of Korea, which is partly, I think, why you know Korea has played a relatively significant role, or, or the city of Seoul has played quite a significant role uh, internationally. Um, in and you know, and it's also uh, been a clearinghouse for best practices internationally on things like the environment and so on as well. I hope they carry out more best practices. Yeah, well, that's a good thing too. I'm, I'm not saying anything is perfect here. Yeah, that's a fair point. Thanks, Amy. Thanks. Great, our next question comes from Olesia. If you could introduce yourself and ask um, one question. Thank you. Thank you. Dear moderator, dear colleagues, uh, the participants of a seminar at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies on Global Political Cities, Actors and Arenas of Influence in International Affairs, their guests and invitees. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event. My name is Alesia Vyacheslavovna Kachitkova. 
I have a scientific degree of the Candidate of Sciences in Economics 2008 from the St. Petersburg State University of Economics and Finance, Russian Federation. I thank Dr. Calder for the impressive presentation and I want to ask my core uh, probably one question. <laughs> One yes, question, thank you. Please. Yes, thank you. Please reveal the constitutive essence for conceptualizing the global political economic role of cities in such a way that any definition of the notion included a designation on genus proximum at differentum specificum, literal translation from Latin, the proximate genus and specific difference in their significance, randomnessity, resemblance and contradiction. Maybe, I mean, uh, developed by you unique system of definitions of the notions for conceptualizing the global political economic role of cities, if possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think you, you have an, uh, certainly an important question. Where does my definition of a global uh, political city come from? Uh, if I understand the essence of your correct uh, question. Well, um, I, what I took as a point of departure was um, c some of the uh, broad literature regarding the concept of politics itself. You know, what is what is the essence of of political of a political city as opposed to just simply a global city? Because there could very you know there's a, a broader um, universe of cities that could be considered global but not particularly with polit you know major political uh, functions so uh, one of those obviously is is governance what i many of the cities that i look at, at least i as a point of departure i took national capitals as you know a potential subject to study and i can't st uh, study all 180 or so uh, national capitals in the world but you know that was one universe of cases of national you know political governance a second category was resource allocation which struck me um, i mean uh, you know of uh, much political analysis um, the authoritative allocation of values, for example, is one sort of classic classical uh, um, definition of you know what is uh, politics itself, and um, so the allocation resource allocation it could be budgetary allocation. Some of it could be narrowly political, but it seemed to me that in political economic terms, it's also important to look at um, broader, you know, resource allocation issues in financial markets. So I was willing to consider uh, major financial centers. Um, and the largest of those, uh, New York City, uh, London, and Tokyo, really as, as three that, that uh, should be considered, I, I decided. Um, and then, uh, so resource allocation and governance. The other one was agenda setting. And that becomes a bit more um, su subjective. And I couldn't take, you know, all, you know, I, I, there's the question of what what is, a global agenda, uh, you know, setting a global agenda, what does it involve? But uh, a range of issues that were considered uh, in major international newspapers that were considered in major global uh, forums, like say COP21, the International Environmental uh, Conferences and so on, that Broadly speaking, that that third area as a uh, uh, you know an element of politics to be considered. So that's where I got the main uh, cities that I looked at. Um, there are a couple that I included as foils because at some point in time they were uh, significant, but not at others. 
And I have to say, uh, one issue that I think is very real and I, I'd like to look into more and I think is a reasonable subject for research, you no doubt in that you are from St. Petersburg, you probably are thinking along those lines too. What about major uh, centers, uh, for example, in Russia? Uh, the role that they play as political, um, uh, well, it, it's, I, I think Moscow, for example, certainly for in certain periods, Moscow has been rather important in setting uh, global agendas. I think that's true. Uh, the period that I look at with some interest, and we did some preliminary work on was, um, the new 1920s, for example, under the NEP. And, uh, you know, after the revolution and the way that, um, you know, intellectuals were gathered into Moscow and they were making uh, proposals that had broader global relevance. In some periods later, of course, the Soviet Union became more internally uh, oriented, but, um, also later has be, begun to play a role on global agendas. I, I think there's some legitimate uh, argument for consideration. I'd like to see that question developed of, you know, Russia in its relation to uh, global uh, agendas. It's a different kind of role, I, th I would argue, from the sort of paradigm that we're talking about with London and New York and, and uh, Washington, but, you know, something that I think ought, certainly ought to be looked into as well. So Thank you very much. I hope that helps a little bit. Uh, as I said, those three criteria, that governance and resource allocation and then agenda setting. And um, as I say, I'd, I'd like to see more on uh, the role of Russian uh, global political cities as well. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Our next question is from Yoon. Yoon Han, if you could introduce yourself and ask one question. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Collars, PhD student. And my question, uh, Neef, maybe can you open the slide show one more time? There is one figure that's really interesting. I'll go down. Can't remember which one, but no, next, next, next. Uh, yeah, this one. So um, this chart gives me the impression that leadership, like mayors are more important, like a factor in like determining determining whether a city is like global political city or not? Or is there any hierarchy here in terms of the relative importance of this like number of power forums, grassroots and civic leaders? Yeah, and that's, uh, yeah. Again, that, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, and I go back to what I think I mentioned to uh, Marsha that, uh, you know, this is a multivariate analysis question. We have several different types of, um, you know, of, of dynamics uh, occurring. Uh, if, do, can you, Neve, can you put that back again, the, the chart, and I, so that people can see it? Um, now, it is true that civic leaders relate to those three uh, aspects of, um, of the political functions of cities, um, resource allocation, governance, and agenda setting. Now, um, that I think it's probably fair to say that they play, if, if the leaders themselves have enough um, a leeway to serve as major political figures, that that uh, gives them quite a bit of flexibility. And more so, it, it, it's a different sort of role than the role of, um, you know, say a, a penumbra of power. What I mean there is like the think tanks or universities, the, the politics of advice. 
they play a role in in um, it can be a very important role and probably it's fair to say that it indirectly it can also relate to governance uh, the penumbra of power uh, I wouldn't say resource allocation so much but indirectly it probably relates to governance as well the penumbra of power by which we mean like think tanks, universities, the politics of advice has quite a diffuse and significant, although uh, not entirely visible role uh, in relationship to uh, not just agenda setting, but indirectly insofar as, you know, what people know affects what they do, what policymakers do. It affects them. This chart is probably needs one or two more arrows. But broadly speaking, um, I think, I guess I would argue that where civic leaders have sufficient autonomy to serve as major national figures that they are probably more important than the others. Of course, in a lot of places, take Washington, D.C., where um, the mayor, uh, you know, Washington, D.C. doesn't have statehood. The mayor has more, much more limited roles. Or in China, um, you know, the uh, mayors have a somewhat limited role. Uh, so there are some countries where, uh, or in France up until uh, the late, until Chirac, mayors were not elected. Um, in several countries, the mayors are not elected. So there's, there's a qualification. Um, it depends on the institutional structure, but broadly speaking, I think it's fair to say that of those four, the mayors are the most important uh, uh, element in terms of the global political role of cities. Thank you for the clarification. I think we're just about to wrap up, but we have one more question from Caillou Lee. Caillou, if you could introduce yourself and ask a question. Oh, thank you for uh, your uh, giving me this opportunity to ask. Uh, my name is Kaiyu Li. I'm a PhD student in political science. And thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, it seems to, at least based on your presentation, some of the cities you mentioned are capital cities of the rising countries or established countries in the world, which I assume would attract a, an increasing number of think tanks and different um, international organizations. But uh, it seems to me that those th different think tanks, institutions, organizations, universities, they are the actors that actually shape the policy making, but not the city. So like cities are still like, like a, a fields in which different actors uh, interact and shape the policy making. So my question is, can you elaborate more on city as an actor that shape the national politics or in, even international politics? Like, okay. yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah, well, I think that's, that's a fair a point. Obviously the city as actor, if it has a, a clear representative, for example, a mayor, then uh, that's pretty clear, it's not ambiguous. But what I do am trying to point to is the whole, the, you know, the, the systemic issue. I, if, you, if we're going to compare, just to say that, say the Brookings Institution is a significant think tank, doesn't give you a sufficient picture of why Washington is, the kind of important global center that it is. It's not simply, it, it's also the systemic question. It's the, the interrelationship. It, I mean, those of us, many of us are on normally, if it weren't for this pandemic, we'd be on Massachusetts Avenue. And you've got Brookings and you've got CSIS and you've got AEI and you've got the Peterson Institute. Uh, right, Carnegie, right next to one another. You've got maybe five of the top think tanks in the world interacting with each other. And of course, a lot of our students also are doing internships or they're, they're uh, listening, they're going to meetings. And, you know, that's also what draws people from throughout the world to a place like Miss, Massachusetts Avenue. It's, 
it's a variant of what uh, Michael Porter in his competitive clusters, I think, was talking about. It's like the Silicon Valley of think tanks. And so the, the fact that you have all of that are around St. Saint James Place in London, you know, Chatham House, and it's not that far away down by the Seine to go over to the IISS or to uh, you know, some of the other think tanks in London. There's a complex that interacts with, it, with one another and also with government and with insurance companies or financial institutions uh, like I'm talking about, which is, you know, that's not captured by just talking about uh, a, a, an individual think tank. That is, that's why I think you ask a very good question and it's fair enough that, that you know, what at a, some level, the, the issue is what individual institutions or even individual decision makers or analysts within institutions, what do they do? I, I like to uh, disaggregate down to the actual level at which things happen too. I, so I see what you're saying, but what I'm trying to raise is the more systemic question of the nature of the communities that are, uh, you know, that are created in these cities. And I think some of them, and Washington's a conspicuous case. And San Francisco, I also talk a lot about in the book. I think San Francisco uh, has a lot of, it's been remarkably creative as a city uh, or the San Francisco Bay Area. And it's precisely for a similar reason. It's not that there's one um, think tank or there's one institution. It's that you have many of them that are interrelating to, uh, to one another. So there's a systemic uh, dynamic, which is much greater than the sum of, of the parts. But anyway, that's, I think you ask a very good question and, and that would be my answer. It's true, the city is not, uh, in not the own, not the real proximate actor, but the city could be the best place unit of analysis to use because um, that captures the interaction among. Um, anyway, that that would be my point. Sounds like we have uh, various friends from various places. Is that? I don't know. Yes, I believe that someone's uh, mute, unfortunately, turned off. Uh -huh. But I think this is a good time for us to wrap up. We are at our witching hour, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. But Dr. Calder, do you have any final thoughts on the world as a Zoom stage, as opposed to no. Shakespeare's The World as a Stage? Well, I, that's right. I think this shows us that the world is a stage. And I was delighted to have comments from St. Petersburg and from Seoul. And I believe Yun is over in Bologna. And uh, we have people from all over the world who are on uh, this particular call. And that's the kind of dialogue that we have. But in conclusion, what I would say, I would go back to the enduring importance of institutions and that are located in a particular a particular location here we have just the value of i think the, of size itself and massachusetts avenue and the kind of interaction that can occur it's it's not just that zoom means that you can talk everybody can talk to everybody about anything it follows a particular line and I think it does give um, some enduring possibilities to, at least in the short run, maybe some uh, other group uh, from some other part of the world is just going to arise and do exactly what we're doing and do it better. But at this point, I think there are certain enduring um, values that uh, something like a global political city like Washington has become are giving us. So that's maybe where I'd like to put it, but to thank everybody for uh, a tremendous discussion and for everything that they've contributed uh, to this book.
So thank you very much. Uh, I've learned a lot and I, I appreciate everybody's help.